Ladies and gentlemen, the next session of today's event will focus on financial inclusion in the digital age. Our keynote speaker in this session will answer the question, the fintech conundrum. Does increasing inclusion for some mean increasing exclusion for others? The topic will be addressed by the director of the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance, Dr. Robert Wardrop. Bob is a professor in management practice on the faculty of the Cambridge Judge Business School, where he teaches in the MBA and the Master of Finance programs. He is also the founding director of the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance, a world-leading research centre studying the global development of digital financial services. He is the academic program director of the Centre's Cambridge Fintech and Regulatory Innovation Online Program, which has enrolled financial services regulators and policymakers from more than 100 countries. Bob, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me okay. And I'm going to spend the next sort of 15 minutes talking about what I would describe as the no free lunch question. So, of course, when we talk about fintech innovation, there's a lot of enthusiasm in it, and there's growing evidence, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly and illustrate, regarding the positive impact that fintech innovation has on financial inclusion. But the real question that has occurred to me, particularly over the past sort of six to 12 months, is that it also introduced risk of exclusion, particularly as we've gone through the COVID period. And I'm going to talk about that with respect to some of our emerging research, but also some personal observations that I've made with respect to my own personal life and my, my family, actually. So first of all, in today's talk, I'm gonna cover kind of three basic areas. Again, and as I referred to earlier, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the FinTech impact on financial inclusion. Secondly, the importance of COVID and the impact on what I would call FinTech adoption or the rate of adoption of digital financial services that have been a product of that innovation. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the exclusion risks that I see may be emerging. And most importantly, perhaps, what can be done to mitigate those risks? So while there may be no free lunch, in other words, the risk of exclusion emerges as we achieve higher levels of financial inclusion, it's not a complete trade-off. There are things I think we can do to help that balance weight towards inclusion much more than increasing exclusion. So let's start with just a basic overview of financial inclusion. So Financial inclusion, I think, has really come onto the radar screen. It's a core regulatory objective of many jurisdictions. I'm showing here just a very simple graph to show regionally the shift in account ownership in Europe and Central Asia. So we see um, the blue bar would be sort of 2011. Uh, the gray bar would be the most recent data from the Findex data that sort of tracks um, individuals that own accounts, so a transaction accounts, right? Um, which are, um, are not necessarily bank accounts. A bank account certainly is a transaction account, but where the impact of FinTech has been most profound is broadening that definition of account, because obviously a mobile money account through which you can make payments, for example, is a transaction account. So that's the proxy we typically use for financial inclusion is account ownership. And what we see in some of these regions, the South Caucasus, for example, uh, or Eastern Europe, significant increases in financial inclusion as people acquire transaction accounts. Whereas you know, in Northern Europe, Western Europe, sort of almost 100% of those populations have had accounts. Now, we see evidence clearly of the powerful impact of say, these transaction accounts, these non-traditional bank accounts when we take a look at Sub-Sahara Africa. So what I'm showing here in the graph is different financial products made available over mobile money networks in Sub-Sahara Africa. And uh, we see the, the gold or yellowish um, bars, which represent Mshwara, which is a savings product in Kenya. If you remember, M-Pesa, of course, which is the poster child uh, of mobile money payment systems, uh, people often cite as an example of financial inclusion. You see other kinds of financial services like Mshwara, savings accounts, the growth in the registration of those accounts for savings increasing dramatically between 2012 and 2018. And as other countries followed with similar mobile money systems, you see the growth similarly, but lagging Kenya. So this is fintech innovation clearly illustrated as having impact. And when we talk to you know, regulators, this is some work we did with the World Bank back in 2019, we really wanted to understand the regulator perspective on whether they felt 
you know, financial inclusion was being positively impacted by these sort of non-traditional transaction accounts or what we call alternative finance channels. And what we see here, financial inclusion specifically very highly rated, right? So in other words, the, the, the dark blue indicates positive impact when you take kind of the, the um, positive impact, the majority, but you know, there's other categories related to financial inclusion. If we go up to say, uh, you know, consumer access to finance, well, you could argue that's a you know, link to financial inclusion and certainly SME access to finance. So when we talk about inclusion, we also, also talk about not just fully excluded communities, but also underserved communities. Now, that kind of sets the context, but what has happened with COVID? COVID's had a very powerful impact. Now, it was mentioned earlier in the introduction that I, I lead a program, we have cohorts of about 150 regulators uh, three times a year. It really trains them in adapting and developing financial regulation, developing frameworks for understanding fintech innovation to inform the regulatory change they can make in response to changes in business model and technology. Okay, and so I, I often in the weekly sessions that are live, I pull the regulators, I ask them a pertinent question. In April, I asked them this question. I said, how do you think the rate of adoption of digital financial services in your country will change due to COVID-19? You see very strong views expressed. It's gonna increase the rate of adoption, okay? Some reasonable portion saying staying the same, no one's saying decrease. I asked the same question in October when it was becoming very, very clear that COVID was having a powerful impact. And what you see is of course that increase, those that believe it's gonna increase the rate of adoption much stronger. And, you know, when we step back and think about why, well, look, there were really interesting, particularly around payments. Our research has shown us that payments, mobile payments, or online pay, payments, sh behavior shifted dramatically. This is just an example from Pakistan. These are weekly mobile payment volumes. You can see here week by week, starting before the lockdown happened in March in Pakistan, you had about 313 million during the week of lockdown. Uh, of, of payments flowing over mobile payment networks. But go to the right to the week of May 1st, all of a sudden, 60% increase, $582 million. And what you can see is the transaction numbers going up. And it's not just because people had an aversion to cash. I think it's important to recognize that there were regulatory measures that kicked in to facilitate that behavioral shift. I'm going to talk about those a little bit more later. In fact, what we saw in our research we published recently with the World Bank was the more stringent, the regulatory measures with respect to lockdown, the bigger the shift in payments and other adoption of fintech driven services during the pandemic period, because regulators effectively accommodated behavior shift in relation to the severity of the lockdown. Now, there's a ver another very important trend that I think we need to be cognizant of, which is absolutely accelerated during COVID. And this is what I call the acceleration and the embedding of financial services. And by embeddedness, what I mean is that financial services are being embedded in other services. And this chart, this diagram sort of illustrates and uses technology firms as an analogy for this. We go to the left. We see five different verticals, financial services, technology, telecoms, energy manufacturing, distinct verticals. Tech was a distinct vertical before the internet era. But we go to the middle set, right? Post internet, tech became embedded in everything. It became foundational in other verticals. And in fact, the S&P 500 recategorized tech firms about two years ago. Many firms that were referred to as being in the tech index were moved out and actually put in communications. So the number of firms today that we actually call tech firms is shrinking because tech is embedded in every firm. When we go to the right, our argument here is that the same is happening with financial services. Financial services is being embedded in other verticals, in telecommunications that may be the mobile payments, for example, uh, like I referred to earlier with M-Pesa, or it may be pay-as-you-go energy systems that is developing across much of the developing world, or in manufacturing, maybe transfers of value in IoT systems, cleared by blockchain. I, I heard a discussion of blockchain initiatives earlier as we opened this program. So financial services like tech are becoming an enabler, shifting horizontally and being embedded in other verticals. And this is very important when we start to think about where the emergent areas of potential exclusion are. 
And let's talk about where some of those areas are and maybe how, how they could be mitigated. Now, there was a, a, a pretty interesting paper done a few years ago by, by CGAP. Uh, and if you haven't, many of you may or may not be familiar with CGAP's data. They do terrific work, very closely linked with the World Bank. And they began to sort of understand issues around fraud and particularly mobile financial services. And they list a number of different areas of risk. But I think some of those risks are highly relevant to what I would call potential exclusion risk. And I would categorize three key areas of risk that I suspect are emerging. One is channel risk. As I switch from, let's say, a non-digital channel as a user to a digital channel user, I'm dealing with a new interface. I'm dealing with the unfamiliar. And that can have reactions I'll talk about a little bit earlier that I think can lead to exclusion. Second, I think there's customer and compliance risk. If I'm an individual who is dependent on sort of informal economy transactions, perhaps I, I'm not using digital channels today. To use digital channels, to get that transaction account I need, because remember, as digital channels become more prevalent, there's going to be a, a, a reduction in the availability of other channels, non-digital channels. So if I need to satisfy KYC due diligence requirements, to join the digital channel ecosystem, can I? And that really is an area around managing customer and compliant risk, because if I can't satisfy those requirements, I can't join. The third area is in regulatory supervision enforcement, very squarely in the realm of regulators, and it has to do with system trust. Because I think if new risks emerge, and our research has shown significant emerging risk with respect to cyber through COVID, expressed, by the way, both on the part of fintech firms as well as regulators. If, it's, if, it, if you don't have visibility on that emergent risk, on that malfeasance, and you can't enforce on it, there's a risk of compromising system trust. And individuals will not adopt digital channels as just as a sociological cognitive issue if they do not have trust in the system that they're engaging in for the first time. They just won't adopt. So how do we address each of these? I want to talk about channel risk first. I think we need to move away from strictly defining financial inclusion in the context of access. In other words, do I have access to a transaction account? In other words, do I have a transaction account? It's actually about usability. Both are potential drivers of exclusion, right? I think, and when I talked earlier about the personal perspective I have on this, to be frank, I think of my mother. My mother is in her 80s. She lives in Canada. My mother, very cognitive, you know, cognitively functioning, she doesn't have an email account. In fact, she doesn't have a, a computer. She doesn't have an iPad. She just got a simple phone, which is not a smartphone, at the insistence of her children. And so if you want to reach my mother, you basically need to call. And she never turns it on. You need to call my mother on her fixed line phone or you can't reach my mother. Now, my mother pays her rent with a check. She signs a piece of paper, walks out of her apartment, goes somewhere and deposits it. Now, checks represent 2% of payments and shrinking in Canada today. When So when checks disappear, what does my mother do? Now, this is in a highly, highly developed economy. My mother has access to the financial system. My mother has an account. She can go to the bank and take out money in the local bank branch. But if that bank branch closes and she migrates to a mobile channel, I am not certain that my mother will understand how to actually access that channel, use that channel, and execute transactions. What my mother needs is technology literacy. And so historically, when we talked about bringing people into the financial system, we talked about financial literacy, possessing the skills that allow people to make informed decisions with their money. My mother understands what a loan is. She understands what debt is. She understands what budgeting is. Her problem is technology literacy. So there are vulnerable groups that need to adopt technology knowledge in addition to financial knowledge. Second, with respect to customer and compliance risk, absolutely regulatory support from regulators is required. Regulators can adopt regulatory compliance obligations, revising their frameworks to support EKYC. There are examples out there. If they're not introduced, it's going to be very difficult to migrate large numbers of people onto 
uh, mobile channels. And, and this is research we published with the World Bank, which we published about two weeks ago, where fintechs, they're providing payments, providing are, are imploring regulators for more support in terms of onboarding, customer due diligence, and EKYC. Or they can't bring people into the systems, the channels that have accelerated adoption during the COVID period. And finally, some of this falls directly on regulators to up their game in terms of supervision. I think it's, it's you know, a lot of talk about subtech, but to mitigate the risk of exclusion, to support the development of system trust that is going to migrate behaviors of people who are not 18 year olds old and familiar with a smartphone to migrate from the way they interact and pay and borrow today to new systems, you, you need to move to new forms of supervision and new ways of collecting data to provide visibility on where you need to enforce. This is an example from the Philippines, I won't go into it in great detail, about a chatbot that was developed where any consumer can simply send in an example of malfeasance or a complaint with a backend system that can sort and process that data to highlight areas using machine learning where enforcement action deserves more human attention and action. It's through these kinds of mechanisms, new technologies, where individuals, just consumers, or shifting their behaviors are going to shift their behaviors with confidence as a result of system trust. So with that, I'm going to summarize by saying, I think, a few simple points. Number one, we do have substantial evidence that fintech innovation has positively impacted financial inclusion. That's abundantly clear. The, the impact of that is being brought forward as a result of this COVID accelerated adoption phenomenon. Digital financial services are much more broadly deployed today than they were six or nine or 12 months ago. And that opens up these areas of exclusion risk. And we need to mitigate them to maximize the impact and harvest the benefit of fintech innovation. And I'm suggesting there are these three areas focusing on technology literacy in addition to financial literacy, providing targeted areas of regulatory support for digital financial services, particularly in onboarding, and deploying new subtech tools by regulators to increase the visibility on malfeasance, on fraud, uh, areas of, of risk emerging that consumers are being impacted by to enable enforcement and build confidence. And with that, I thank you for listening. Thank you, Bob, uh, for that passionate and strong keynote address regarding the burning issue of where financial inclusion really begins and what challenges we must still address.